Good, yeah. All right, Hale. Um, so yeah, I guess, are there any questions to start with? Um, anything about the recent lecture, anything about, um, yeah, anything on the exercises, um, anything in general? Um, contractibility is like a really important topic. So I wanna make sure that any questions you have about it get answered. Um, um, I don't have a super specific question. I've, re I've reread the lecture notes since yesterday and I'm okay with a lot of it. But one of the things that maybe if you could just say a couple words about is the, the uh, what's it called? Singleton induction. Oh, yeah, totally. That we seems can... like very uh, obscure to me. Like, I, I don't know, I'm having trouble with it. Out of Yeah, so. for sure. Let's, uh, let's take a second talk about singleton induction then. Um, one sec. Let me get this pulled up and a screen share going. Okie doke. Oh, and let me, uh, I forgot to do this last time. Let me mute Discord uh, before we start. Um, okay, now let me do this again. Okay, so uh, what's the idea of singleton induction? Well, recall, where's my pen? Here we go. So recall, uh, A is contractible. Uh, I think I missed an N in here. Okay, so A is contractible if and only if A is equivalent to a singleton, right? Um, does this make sense so far? So remember contractibility. Uh, yeah, I remember that being like a lemma or something that we proved. I don't necessarily remember the details, but intuitively. <laughs> Obviously, that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Contractibility, remember, uh, I can say a quick word about it. This is going to bother me, so let me, there we go. I remember the end this time. So remember, contractibility says that uh, there exists an A, so that for all X of type A, A is equal to X. So if you think about this as saying that everything in X is actually equal to A, or everything in A is just this one little A. And so it makes sense. This is saying that there's like up to homotopy, there's exactly one point in A, right? And so that's saying that A should be, uh, um, that A should be the same thing as the singleton. Um, if you're more familiar with the homotopy theoretic interpretation, then what's this saying? This says there exists an A so that there exists a function, which is sort of uniform in X, uh, giving me paths from X to A. And if you're familiar with homotopy theory, this is exactly saying that there exists a deformation retract from my entire space onto singleton A, um, which is another way, um, if there's a deformation retract onto a point, that's exactly what it means for a space to be contractible in classical homotopy theory. Um, okay, so, so we know that if A is contractible, then A is equivalent to one, but informally, we know that uh, the fact that A is equivalent to one uh, tells us that any property of one, so anything true of one should be true of A. Right? And why is this? this and that's exactly because, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, no, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, you're so fine. Um, I was just going to say that this is because intuitively equivalence of types is telling me that those two types carry the same information up to homotopy. And right. so uh -huh. if you like, we can make this precise with univalence where univalence will let us turn this into a equality in the universe. A is equal to one, where then literally anything true of one, we can transport along this equality and get that it's true of A as well. Right. I was even thinking too, isn't, um, isn't equivalence like a stronger version of something that we haven't necessarily defined uh, mm -hmm. here, but logical equivalence, which is just functions back and forth? Yeah, exactly. Uh, in, the, uh, in the proposition interpretation, so types as propositions, then yeah. equivalence literally is just uh, implication left and right. Mm -hmm. Right, right. 
Um, in general, equivalence contains some bonus homotopy theoretic interpretation. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so anything true of one should be true of A, but let's take my favorite thing that's true of one. Uh, where's my pen? Uh, but we know uh, one satisfies, one satisfies unit induction, right? Induction on one. And what's the type of induction on one? Well, it says that uh, if I can prove some property holds of star, then this lets me conclude that for any X in one, that property holds for X, right? So, so under our equivalence, And if you chase through the definition of this equivalence, where uh, contractibility tells me that A is equivalent to one, under our equivalence, the center of contraction, center of contraction, C uh, is identified with star. Um, so obviously in the map from A to one, everything gets sent to star, but in the map from one to A, star gets sent to C. And then we use the center of contraction in order to show that this uh, is uh, essentially surjective isn't the right word, but morally that's what I mean. Um, so yeah, so this is great. So we should morally at least, again, I'm not actually constructing you a term, but I'm telling you why such a term should exist. We should have a term which is induction on one, but in A, right? Where I've sort of transported singleton induction to A. And what should this do? Well, instead of saying B of star goes to for all X of type one B of X, this should say, if I know B of the center of my contraction C, then I should know that for all X of type A, B of X. But this is exactly singleton induction. And so this is some uh, rough justification for the existence of this term. Again, if you want to like actually build it precisely, then you need to do a little bit more work. But um, does this make sense as to like why we might expect it to exist? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, singleton induction is really important. So I'm glad we chatted about that. Uh, depending on which exercises we do, um, we're going to be using singleton induction all over the place. Um, yeah, other questions about stuff? Let me check chat. Nothing in I, chat so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a question if, if we can. Uh, yeah. In lecture, I think it's just something I missed, but we had a few different notions of inverse of a function. There was has inverse, uh, mm -hmm. which has sort of like some non-trivial homotopy. Uh, there was like by inverse and has coherent inverse. And yeah. I, I understood that those those last two didn't, they were contractible, which is great. And has inverse is not, but it looked like we built an equivalence between has inverse and the other ones. And I'm not sure how that meshes with the, the homotopy non-equivalence between them. Oh, interesting. Um, so now I'm going to embarrass myself and admit that I didn't actually watch it yesterday's lecture. Um, so, yeah, so I'm not, I can't exactly speak to uh, what equivalence may or may not have said. I will definitely say has inverse and has homotopy coherent inverse. Um, those are definitely going to be uh, different or has uh, either quasi inverse or bi inverse or something like that. Um, because again, um, one of these will be contractible or two of these maybe, and the other one won't be. Um, yeah, so it's possible that I just missed the extra assumption that was stated in lecture or something. So that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Uh, sorry about that. If you at me in the Discord, uh, I like pinky promise I'll watch the lecture by the end of the day, and then I can uh, give you a better answer. Yeah, sorry about that. Knowing that they're not equivalent is already reassuring. So thank you. Okay, totally. Yeah, one of them is contractible and the other isn't. So uh, yeah. Okay. Other questions? About There's um. Sorry, I. <laughs> There's uh -huh. a, on that on that topic. Um, 
in the lecture slides, uh, slide 10 in the PDF, there is this diagram with arrows pointing in between uh, has inverse and is coherent inverse and is contractible. And uh, uh, it certainly seems to imply that they are all equivalent in some sense. Okay, let's see. So yeah, I think that's the exact diagram that confused me. Uh, this would have been lecture six, yeah? Yep. Uh, page 10. Let's see. Whoa, it's like drawing the PDF in real time. That's wild. Okay. Um, how do I tell what page I'm on? It doesn't say anywhere conveniently. Uh, I guess I'll just do this. Okay. Okay. So has inverse of F, whoa. Okay. So is coherent inverse implies is contractible, uh, has contractible fibers, okay, that's true. And then is contractible F says that F has an inverse. I agree with that as well. I can compose these paths and get this. Is equiv F back and forth. I mean, there's already a problem, right? If, cause is equiv is supposed to be contractible, right? Uh, yes, is equiv is definitely contractible. And we know that that's equivalent to has the inverse, right? Didn't we already show that? Well, uh, has inverse definitely implies, uh, so. Oh, maybe not equivalent. We can just go both ways. Right, uh, exactly. Maybe okay, so maybe maps. that's the problem with the Saying diagram. that we have maps yeah. in either direction is not saying that those guys not are going to be inverse each other. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that's the issue. My, my guess is that's what's being, again, uh, I can tell you better once, we, uh, once I watch the lecture. But my guess is this is saying yeah. that sort of propositionally these are all equivalent in the sense that if I can prove one, then I can convert that into a proof of the other. But yeah, geometrically, it's just the logical equivalents, not exactly. the theoretic equivalents. Exactly. Having maps in both directions doesn't tell you the two types are equivalents. Um, right. Let me come up with a quick example. Um, we know that there are maps in both directions from one to two, right? Where in one direction I send star to true. In the other direction, I send everything to star, um, but this is not an equivalence. So this is telling you that uh, somehow propositionally they contain similar information, um, but that's different from saying that we have an equivalence. So my guess is that's what's happening here. Yeah, fantastic. Um, that part is kind of confusing. They all apply each other, but inverse is equivalent. Exactly. You also thought they were all equivalent. Yeah, no, uh, implies both ways. Awesome. Did, oh, did my example um, explain why um, implies both ways is not equivalent? I can write it up again. So we have maps in both directions between one and two, where in one direction we send star to true, and in the other direction we send true and false to star. And so we have a map in both directions. The problem is that if I go around, um, I don't get back where I started. So here, if I start at false, and then I go to star, and then I come back, I get to true. And so I ended up somewhere different than where I started. And so in an equivalence, we want to know that not only do we have maps in both directions, but also that these maps are inverses uh, up to homotopy. Um, yeah, there was another question. Well, I was just going to say, what does that even mean, like, logically, or like proposition as types? Yeah, exactly. So propositions as types, uh, this is telling me that they're, uh, they're propositional truncations. So, okay. so these guys would be equivalent. Right. Um, and so if you like, this is telling you that one of them is non-empty if and only if the other one is non-empty. Right? Would we have that generally, say if we have types A and B, A of type A, B of type B, Mm -hmm. then we would have that the propositional truncation of A is equivalent to the propositional truncation of B. Absolutely, because the propositional truncation in the meta, so this is not uh, provable inside the theory. If this were provable in the theory, that's basically excluded middle, but sort of from the outside world, we know that this is only ever gonna be one or zero. Uh, it's either going to be just a singleton or it's going to be uh, the empty type depending on whether or not A is empty. And so as soon as you have two guys which are inhabited, those guys are both gonna have a uh, one as their truncation. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense?
I hope that makes sense. Uh, okay, have we defined propositional truncation yet? We have not defined propositional truncation yet. Um, so uh, this guy here, if you want, um, think about it as being like uh, a goes to zero, goes to zero. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, you should think about this as being, uh, you, it's not quite this. Um, what it really is, is we are killing all of the homotopy theoretic structure above dimension negative one, uh, which is this is supposed to say negative one. Um, depending on what book you read, they might call this one instead of negative one, because it's a little bit annoying that our dimensions start at negative two. Um, but you know, that's how it is. Um, this is, yeah, exactly. It, it's killing all of the higher homotopy structure. And so uh, zero dimensional structure is saying that you're a set. So you're allowing multiple points with no paths. Um, and so killing even the set structure is saying that you have at most one point, which is um, exactly what it means to be a proposition, is if you have at most one point, you're either a singleton or you're empty. Why does double negation kill all of that? Sorry, that might- Oh yeah, obvious. totally. Because A goes to zero, goes to zero, right? If A, so again, I'm gonna argue meta-theoretically for a second. If A is inhabited, uh, then this is empty, right? But empty implies empty is just true. And oh. if A is not inhabited, then this is the identity and that just implies false. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's some meta-theoretic justification for why doing this kills the homotopy structure. Um, but again, this is not how we define the propositional truncation. We define propositional truncation as a certain modality on the universe, whatever that means. Um, and yeah, um, you can read about that certainly in the hot book, almost certainly in Egbert's book as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good questions. Um, I'll, I'll stop talking about propositional truncation now because um, it's more complicated uh, than we maybe want to go into. And also, you know, today is supposed to be about contractibility, so. I have one more question about it. Maybe that would be sure. better to ask in the Discord then. Uh, go ahead and ask it. I will let you know if I can answer it quickly. Okay. Um, I've encountered uh, in some papers that type theorists prefer not to define things by universal properties and to define them by the introduction elimination computation rules directly. Mm -hmm. Is there like a good reason, I guess, that type theorists don't like defining things by universal property? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, that one I think is probably best uh, left to the Discord. Um, okay. Not only because it'll take us a little bit astray from here, but also because like, I really am only cosplaying as a type theorist. I'm really a geometer. And so um, I feel like it, it'll be good to have other voices present for that discussion who can say more about uh, the computation stuff. Okay. Totally. Um, yeah, other questions about things. Um, I can pull up, okay, so here were the notes. Uh, let's take a look at, we can prove some of these together. Uh, not is, uh, so saying that the empty type is not contractible is uh, not super hard and might be um, a cute way for us to remember the definition of his contractibility. Uh, what's this exercise? Okay, this is basically true by definition. And then, oh, that's cute. Uh, yeah, that works. Okay, so th this is a really cute problem, actually. Um, I'll probably suggest we go over this if nobody else has questions about things. Oh, there's a question. Uh, makes a note to ask you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, feel free. Uh, ask me, ask me whatever. Uh, I know like a handful of things. Um, okay, so that if A is contractible, the identity type is also contractible. Okay, this is, a, this is definitely a three-star exercise. Uh, this is also a very important exercise conceptually. So I would also suggest we uh, spend some time on this. Um, wow, who wrote the exercises this week? Uh, really good job. Okay, um, this is also a really great exercise. Um, and this has really nice geometric content. So uh, maybe, okay, we also were already down to like a half an hour left. So um, we probably won't get to everything, but I'll at least draw a picture showing why this is true because this there's a cute picture associated to this. Um, yeah, and same thing. Uh, we can do this if people want. Um, we can also uh, 
there's a cute picture that will uh, clarify why this is true. I feel like this is the most obvious intuitively. Um, you would definitely like to go over number four, most interested in number four. Okay, let's do number four then. So let me first draw a picture. Um, actually, before we do number four, uh, let's just do number one because it's fast and it will remind us what it means for something to be contractible. And then we'll uh, come into number four. Um, so for number one, right, we want to show not is contractible the empty type, right? Which I guess we're writing as the empty set, which I personally disagree with, but okay, whatever. Um, and so what is this trying to show? This means we want to show is contractible of the empty type to the empty type, right? Okay, well now let's remember what is the definition of is contractible. Well, is contractible of the empty type is exactly saying that there exists an element of the empty type. So we're already in a bad spot <laughs> saying that there exists an element of the empty type. So that for all X in the empty type, that guy is actually equal to the center of contraction. Uh, and now just writing down the definition, we see exactly how we're going to get this because if we take my center of contraction and my proof that uh, every guy is equal to the center of contraction and I just spit out C, then what have I done? I've taken a guy and is contractible and I've spit out a guy of empty type. So we're done. Uh, questions about this? Okay, um, and this should also uh, make some intuitive sense, right? Because saying that you're contractible is saying that you're equivalent to a one point set. And if there's one thing I know about a zero point set is it shouldn't be the same thing as a one point set. Okay, so now let's get to four. So let's remind ourselves what four was. So we want to know the projection function uh, is an equivalence if and only if uh, B, each B of A is contractible, totally. So let's start off with a quick picture of why this is true. So let's say we have a space down here, A, okay? And uh, eventually we're gonna think of A as a geometric space. But let's start just by thinking of A has three points, right? So here's little A, here's little B, here's little C, right? And now what's gonna go up here? Up here is sigma X of type A, B of X. And above every point, oops, we're gonna get the fiber. So here is the fiber of, oh, I guess this is the fiber of projection one at A. Here's the fiber of projection two, projection one at B. Uh, and here's the fiber of projection one at C, right? And so, but of course, in this case, we know what the fibers should be. This is exactly B of A. This is exactly B of B. Okay, maybe not my uh, greatest naming choice. And this is exactly B of C, right? And so the fact that we know that each of these B of A's is contractible is telling me that there's only one guy in each of these fibers. But if I have only one guy in each of these fibers, right, then it's obvious that this should be an equivalence because, okay, I have one guy down here and that corresponds to one guy up here. I have one guy down here and that corresponds to one guy up here. And I have one guy down here, which corresponds to one guy up there. Um, and now if we draw a slightly more complicated geometric picture, let's think of A as the circle, for instance. So before A was like a potato, now I'm actually thinking where the points of A were inside. Now A is a circle. And I'm thinking about literally like this circle here, which I've drawn in perspective, uh, are my points of A. And now, again, we're saying that every fiber is contractible. So to every point in the circle, we associate a fiber. But now we're saying that that fiber only has one point. So to every point in the circle, let me draw it in pink again, to every point in the circle, so here's like B of base, we only have one point. And you can see that this is gonna be uh, the, the total space over all X1 
of B of X. And again, you can see that this is like, this is just another circle, <laughs> right? Because above every point, we have exactly one point. Um, does this uh, make it make like intuitive geometric sense why we should have this uh, equivalence? I have one small uh, concern, which is what yeah. if there is a point in A that uh, for which B of that point is empty. And so that wouldn't be represented in the top uh, mm. set, but it would be in the bottom set. It's a good thing we did exercise one. Remember, we're saying that uh, each of these B of A's is contractible, but we know that the empty space is not contractible. Mm. Mm. So being contractible is saying that there is exactly one point in each fiber up to homotopy. So knowing when it says that each B of A is contractible, mm -hmm. that means for all A in A. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is saying that, uh, let me find the problem again. Yes, this is saying that every B of A is contractible. So no matter which term little a you choose, uh, B of little a will be contractible. Rad, cool, I missed that, great, thanks. Oh, yeah, totally, no worries at all. And so this already gives us like a super clean conceptual way to prove this. Um, and how are we going to prove this? Well, we want to show that uh, this sigma type uh, for all x and a, b of x. And then we get this proj one and we get a, right? And so this is, what is this? This sends x and a proof p and maps it to x, right? And we wanna show that this is an equivalence. Well, uh, let me know if this is something that we know is true. Um, I'm just going to assert something. There's, there's a handful of ways to prove this, but here's one way we could prove this. We know each B of X is equivalent to one, right? So this, the sum of all X of type A, B of X is equivalent to the sum of X and A of one, because each of these B of X's is equivalent to one. But this is now obviously equivalent to A. And why is that? Because now if we have the sum of X of type A of one, we want to construct inverse maps to and from A. Well, if we have um, little x star, because now star is the only proof we could possibly have, then we send this to little x. And if we have little x here, well, I want to give this little x and some element of one, well, little x star is the only option. And so it's clear that these are inverses to each other. Um, yeah, I'm less so concerned with that part of it and more with if we have an equivalence, we can quote unquote substitute it into. Yeah, totally. That, that's what I was asking if that's something we've seen before or not. And it sounds I like don't it, know mm -hmm. if it is. I mean, I'm sure uh, it's true. Yeah, totally. I, I will tell you that it is what true. Is that sort of congruence, right? Anytime you can substitute things. Yeah, exactly. Again, if you like, by univalence, the fact that B of X is equivalent to one tells me that actually B of X is equal to one. And now we have these two type families and I can transport along the equality and get exactly this equivalence. Um, so that's one way that you could show this, um, but we don't need univalence to do this. We can uh, run, we can do this by hand. Um, well, I was thinking anytime you want to show an equivalent, you just one thought is just to try to come up with one inverse, like not necessarily the, like you should come up with the is inverse. Mm, yeah, sure. Here we can, uh, let's do this by hand. That's let's like probably show. what my thought would have been to do this. Yeah, for sure. So are you saying let's build this? Yes, yeah, so we know projection. Oh, no, sorry. That's fine too. I meant the original problem. Showing oh. that, like showing, yeah. So you start off by knowing that the projection is a mat, and we want to show that it has an inverse. Mm. That would have been where I would have gone, probably. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and this is like, that is the sort of obvious, like just blunt force approach to solving this problem. Where, yeah, exactly. okay, I'm given one direction and I'm supposed to show that these guys are an equivalence. Let's build the other direction by hand, right? 
And um, this will always work, I'm pretty sure. Um, let me couch that in um, a little bit of ambiguity. Let me say this probably always works if you're sufficiently clever. But sometimes coming up with this inverse, especially as our types get more complicated, um, becomes very difficult. Um, let me give a quick example of that. So theorem. Uh, I don't actually know if this has been formalized in hot. This is definitely true. Uh, I don't know if we know it in homotopy type theory. Um, let's look at S0, which is two points. And this includes into S1, right? So S1 is like a circle. And so now you can think about these guys as being the equator of the circle. And now this guy includes into S2, where again, we think about the circle being the equator of the sphere. And this includes into S3 and so on, where now this guy is going to be the equator of a, of a three sphere in R4. And you keep doing this. Uh, and you can take the co-limit of this process and you get S infinity. And so you glue every sphere into the equator of the n plus one sphere. And you do this infinitely far. Um, theorem, this is contractible. So this is equivalent to one. Um, it is, uh, it doesn't matter what a co-limit is. Um, you, you just glue all of these together. So you, you include the two sphere in the one, or the zero sphere in the one sphere, you include that in the two sphere, and you do this uh, for every sphere. And you glue all of the spheres together. Uh, this ends up being contractible. Um, and it's like really non-obvious why this should be true, <laughs> I think. Um, and so trying to build this equivalence by hand uh, might be tricky. Um, I guess in this case, we only have one choice of a map in either direction. But my, my point is that um, building these kinds of equivalences, um, if you want to do everything by hand, uh, can be challenging. And so using some of the machinery that we've built of, you know, OK, maybe, I, maybe we haven't actually seen that you can do the substitution or whatever. But um, doing these kinds of higher level manipulations is usually uh, conceptually clearer as to what's happening. And then you can trust Agda to take this high level definition you've given. And because everything we've given is defined and everything we've given is computable, uh, you can literally run this equivalence as a program and it will spit out the actual uh, down to the metal function inverse equivalence that you wanted. Um, so yeah, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Awesome. Uh, does this step sum over a one equal a require a to be contractible? No, definitely not. Uh, we showed this intuitively for the circle, right? The circle is not contractible. Um, and yet what we're really saying is that above every point in the circle, so here's a point in the circle, above it is exactly one point in the fiber, right? Because each of these b of x's has one point. You thought you referred to a different question. Ah, got it, got it. Totally. Um, Okay. Um, okay, but let's see if we, uh, so I've just uh, gone off on a long rant saying we should be able to build this by hand. Uh, so let's see if we can think really hard and build this by hand. Okay, so we have X and we have a proof that's uh, living inside of B of X. And we're gonna spit out little X down here. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we're showing, you wanted to show this equivalence. Okay. Um, okay, we want to go the other way. So we have some little x living in A. Um, oh, but we know that each b of x is contractible, right? We know that b of x is contractible. So let's write this as is contractible b of, uh, let's actually call this a fixed term. Let's call this A. So we know that b of A is contractible, right? So that means, well, what's the definition of contractibility? There exists a C in B of A, so that for every proof in B of A, that proof is equal to the center of contraction. So let's take A and let's spit out A, let's call this uh, C of A. The C obviously depends on A, A, C, A. And now, how are we gonna show that these guys are inverse to each other? Well, if we go this way, then we start with A, we get A, C of A, and then we project out A. And so we obviously get back to A and we win. What if we go the other way? Well, we start with XP and then we get X and then we get XC of X. And so what's left to show is that XP is equal to X 
c of x. But this is going to be true. Uh, is, is oh, that's a great question. Uh, is contractibility is a mere proposition? Uh, so is contractible, uh, is contractible of A, provided uh, A really is contractible. So uh, this is really some very surprising fact that in some sense makes a lot of the theory work. Um, yeah, so is contractible. In general, if you ever see, this is not a hard and fast rule, but it is a naming convention that I know the hot book uses. If you see is blah of A, this will be a mere proposition. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, so what were we doing? So we wanted to show that these maps were- And you mean, you mean the difference between saying is and has is important there? Yes, the difference between is and has is important. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mere proposition is a technical term, exactly. Mere proposition says that you're negative one truncated, whatever that means. Um, mere proposition essentially is saying that you're either zero or one. Mm -hmm. um, so mere proposition is saying that there is, not only is there no homotopy theoretic information, but there's actually no set theoretic information at all. Your type is literally a proposition. Um, so mere proposition comes from people saying like, yeah, we're gonna view these types as mere propositions. We're gonna view these types as merely uh, saying that something is true or something is false. And that's all the information we care about. Mm -hmm. So just to finish this off real quick, yeah, we would probably use the thing that we proved in last lecture where you can just look at the components. We know X is obviously equal to X and P is equal to C of X by the, by the thing we just showed about the contraction. Exactly. Okay. And so that's going to show that, um, yeah, so, so, so let, let me say this one more time and I won't get distracted. So if I want to show that doing this composition gives me, so doing this composition gives me the identity is obvious. I start with A, I go to A, C of A, I project down, I get back to A. Going this way is less obvious. I start with XP, I project down to get X, I come back, I get X, C of X. So we want to show that xp is equal to xc of x. But to do this, well, I want to show that these two guys are equal, and they are. And I want to show that up to transport, these two guys are equal. But of course, x is equal to x, so we don't have to transport at all. And we're just checking that p and c of x are the same. But contractibility guarantees that c of cx is equal to p. Right. Yeah, great question. Um, so does this make sense? Uh, how problem four works. Um, it's like a little bit involved, but I think it should be, um, it should be fairly followable. Okay, uh, other questions about things. Let's come back to uh, over here. So we just did four, which is awesome. Um, oh, and I guess this is a, this is another cute one. So I guess we only really did half of problem four, but we did the fun half of problem four. Um, yeah, we could do three. Um, like I said, three. I three three, three mm -hmm. uses the, uh, what was it called? The singleton in induction? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I yeah. mean, maybe maybe you could come up with a way not to use it, but I think the solution in the in the solutions uses it. So, so really? that would probably I'll be honest. Be uh, I'm kind of solving these on the fly. I didn't have a solution in mind. I basically looked at this and said, "Yeah, I could probably prove that if I needed to." Right. Well, there, there's um, a hint then, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you can uh, singleton induction is probably a, a very clean way to prove this. Mm -hmm. Um. So here, let, let's go ahead and do number three, and I'll show you uh, with singleton induction. And uh, if we have time, I'll think really hard and see if I can come up with a way to do it without singleton induction. Right. I tried to do it without it. And then I looked at the solutions man, and I was like, I'm going to have to revisit these notes and figure out what singleton induction is. Yeah, totally, totally. All right. So if A is contractible, so number three says, if A is contractible, uh, then for all X, Y, is contractible x equals y as well, right? Um, 
So let's like see how to do this. We want to show that x equals y is equivalent to one, right? This is the dream. Where now I'm, uh, the, this this should all really be behind some lambda x lambda y, right? Um, but we want to show this for two general uh, x's and y's. Well, uh, so here's the very slick way to do this with singleton induction, um, is to say by singleton induction twice, we can assume, we can assume that X is actually some center of contraction and Y is some center of contraction. So it suffices to show that uh, C equals C is equivalent to one. Uh, but of course, this is going to be true because this is REFL and that goes to star. And then we take star and we send that to REFL. And then why are there no bonus paths in C equals C? Um, wait, why are there no bonus paths in C equals C? Uh, wait, sorry, give me a second. Oh, I, I'm an idiot because the, these maps are just manifestly inverses of each other. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, okay, so this is the, the slick way to do this. Um, but Can you say a bit more about the two instances of uh, singleton induction giving you those definitional qualities? I mean, I, it seems obvious, but yeah, absolutely. I'm still being unfamiliar with singleton induction. I don't really see it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So remember, uh, what does singleton induction say? So singleton induction says what? It says um, uh, to prove, uh, so for any proposition P of A, or let's call it P of C is the letter I was using. So if you can prove something about the center of contraction, then you know that for all uh, X and A, uh, P of X is true. Where now for us, we're doing, um, yeah, we're doing singleton induction on A, right? So let's let P of X be, um, what do I want this to be? I want this to be uh, X equals Y, or let's say P of X is gonna be X equals C is equivalent to one. So this is a perfectly reasonable uh, type. And so we're going to say that P of X is equal to this. And now we're going to do this again. We're going to say that Q of Y, or let's say Q of XY, is going to be X equals Y is equivalent to one. So what we're trying to do is we want to show for all X, for all Y, Q of X, Y, right? This is the dream. Um, and how are we going to do this? Well, to prove this, in order to show for all Y, Q of X, Y, well, by singleton induction, it suffices to show um, Q of X, C. So here we're doing singleton induction on Y, right? So single induction says, if I can show something is true for C, then I can show it's true, uh, it immediately becomes true for every variable. So I do single induction on Y and it allows me to assume that Y is equal to C. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then QXC is definitionally equal, or, or, or definitionally, is equal to P of X. Exactly, so now I'm trying to show for all X, Q of XC, which is another way of saying for all X, P of X. And so to show this, to show this, it suffices to show P of C. Or if you like, equivalently, it suffices to show Q of CC. We're now, uh, we're doing singleton induction. So now we're doing singleton induction 
on x. And of course, q of cc is definitionally c equals c is equivalent to one. And so all we had to do was show that c equals c is equivalent to one, and that's exactly what we did. And then I guess maybe the last hanging question is, I believed mm -hmm. you at first, but now I'm thinking about it again. Why was that the intrinsic inverse that you gave up oh. there? Because yeah. I'm uh, thinking like, why would we just map ref with C? Like if it's C equals C, that's not path induction. Uh, it's a, uh, you can't do path induction on it, so. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so maybe you do leave this blank and maybe you do um base path induction or something yeah may, maybe what you do is you only do singles and in induction once uh sorry let me think about this so you single induction once you're then trying to show that x equals c is equivalent to one and then you do path um, induction and you get wrestle yeah could we use some kind of lemma that like if our space is contractible then uh, wait, no, that's what we're trying to. Yeah, that, that's exactly what we're trying to free. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think so, you're right. I think I think we should leave one free. Yeah, I think if you leave one free and do path induction, that should solve the problem. Um, I have uh, to take a look at the solution that they gave again. I'd also yeah. be interested though into try to doing this. Like, I don't know. I'm really stubborn. Like, I like trying to like do everything like you know directly. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Which is something that I'm trying to learn how not to do, because I know it's going to get to the point where, like you said a minute ago, like that's kind of in, like going to be intractable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see. Um, so, so we can we show directly that uh, x equals y is equivalent to one. Um, uh, give me a second to think about this, and we know that a is contractible. So we have, uh, uh, yeah, so we know that there is some center of contraction type A, and we know that there's a proof P uh, that uh, C is equal to X, and there's a proof Q that C is equal to Y. Um, and we want to show that these are the only proofs. Right, because, okay, so the point is now, uh, I guess this would be Q, uh, P, Q inverse. Right. Has type X equals Y. Or wait, I think it's P inverse Q. Turn, uh, turn. Yep, you're so right, it's P inverse Q, yep. So P inverse Q has type X equals Y. We now want to show that, uh, that this is the only thing. So we know, so, we can send uh, everything here. So we send an arbitrary path alpha goes to star, and we send star goes to p inverse q. And we now want to show that p inverse q is equal to alpha. So, okay, so again, in order to show this is an equivalence, if I go this way, it's obvious because I start at star, I get sent to p equals q, I come back and I get back to star. So that's easy. So we now want to show that if I compose this way, I get back where I started. So we want to show that if alpha has type x equals y, then alpha equals p inverse dot q. And so how would we show that alpha is equal to p inverse dot q? Um, my guess is we do this by Can we path, do induction. path induction. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. path induction works. Path induction works, and let's see why. So we're saying that uh, for all x, for all y, for all alpha, alpha equals p inverse q, right? right? Um, where I'm actually going to uh, make this super precise, where, uh, right, contractibility, so now this is important, these paths are uniform in X and Y, right? So what we really have is, uh, this is really like a PX and a PY, right? Um, rather than P and Q are potentially separate, 
these are remember contractibility if I if we scroll up uh, I know it's written somewhere okay so contractibility is saying uh, that there exists a C so that there is a function sending guys in my space to paths and right. so if we call that function P then rather than P and Q let's call this PX and PY and so this is now PX inverse PY and this is now PX inverse PY and this is going to be important uh, in a moment, you'll see why. So here's PX inverse PY, and here's PX inverse PY. Okay, so now we want to show this. Well, let's path induct on alpha. And so how are we gonna path induct on alpha? Well, we wanna show that for all X, we're now going to assume that Y is X, we may assume that y is actually x and alpha is actually ref x, right? And so knowing this, we now want oh. to know that ref x is equal to, so what do we want to show? We want to show that uh, ref x is equal to px inverse dot, well now py, y is definitely x, so this is px. But of course, this is true uh, by REFL, REFL X, because this guy here definitionally computes to REFL X. I don't think it's definitional, but there is a path, uh, right? The inverse. No, P, PX inverse dot PX is definitionally REFL. Yeah, that's, that's left in from Egbert's book. It's, it's, Um, well, regardless, okay, whether or not you believe that uh, this guy here uh, is definitionally REFL, you certainly believe that it's REFL in the theory. And so um, we're golden. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's a proposition that we proved for any, for any path P, P inverse concatenated with P, there's a path between it and REFL. That's uh, a... Okay, yeah, I may, maybe it's not definitional. But um, at the very least, we know but that. I still know that I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, at the very least, there's something inhabiting this type, and we win. So maybe it's not ruffle ruffle, but uh, you know, there's something here. Uh, yeah, you're right. Showing the dependence on X is the key, because otherwise we'd be sitting there with P yeah, inverse exactly. Q, and not a way to show that an arbitrary path is ruffle. Exactly, and so the really the key insight here is that not only do we have paths from X and Y to C, but actually these paths are uniform. And this is exactly the difference. Um, a lot of people get confused between um, why the definition of is contractible isn't uh, path connected. Because if you look at the definition, uh, it looks like you're saying that there exists an A so that for every X, there's a path from A to X. And saying that there's a path from A to X uh, sounds like you're saying that, um, this space is path connected. Why should this mean contractible? And the answer is because all of these paths from A to X have to be uniform in X. It has to be the same path for all of them. Of course, it's a continuously varying family of paths, which is exactly the data of a deformation retract. And so the fact that um, we can coherently choose these paths ends up being really important down here when uh, coherently choosing the paths lets us substitute in and get this computation. Yeah. Um, okay, this was awesome. Are there any last minute questions about things? Nope, but that was super helpful, thank you. Okay, awesome, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, and this also uh, solves the problem that we had up here by singleton induction. So um, this shows that we could singleton induct on just one of them and then use uh, path induction on the other, so. Um, Maybe I was a little bit hasty in trying to do singleton induction twice. Um, yeah, other questions about things. Uh, we've got another like minute and a half. So if there's any more questions, I'm happy to go over them. Oh, how do you say path connected? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so path connected would be, there exists an A so that, oh, I always get this wrong. Is it merely there exists or, I think you want there exists a C so that for all X, merely C is equal to X. 
And so we've gotten back into uh, propositional truncations. It's either this or maybe this. Uh, uh, now that I've written it, this one's definitely wrong. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure it's this one. Um, and intuitively, this mere propositionness kills the uniformity. This kills the idea that these guys have to all be, uh, that this function has to be uniform in X. This is now saying that um, for every X, I know that there exists some path between C and X, but because this proposition is mere, I've lost the homotopy theoretic information saying that this path has to vary continuously in X. Um, so this would be path connected. Yeah, good question. Are we supposed to think the paths vary continuously over the space? Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, uh, if that's all, it's about noon. So let's go ahead and wrap up. This was awesome. Uh, oh, was there a last I had one. I had one last minute question. So it can sure. happen that the product over mere, uh, the propositional truncations is uh, non-empty, but the product over the actual types is uh, empty. Yes, uh-huh, absolutely. Uh, yes, so it's entirely possible that the product, uh, so it's entirely possible that this, let's say P of X could be inhabited, whereas this is not inhabited. That can absolutely happen. Mm -hmm. um, this is a much weaker assumption. Um, uniformity is fascinating. You have a last question. What's the difference between equals elimination and singleton elimination? Um, I mean, they're, they're just different things. One of them lets you eliminate uh, identity types and one of them lets you eliminate contractible types. Um, and so those are just different things. Um, that's probably a longer question that's worth putting in the Discord. Um, okay, this was awesome, everyone. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Uh, I'll see you all like at some point, uh, maybe at my office hours in like an hour. Okay, take care. All. Bye. Uh, let me stop the recording.